Dear brothers and sisters, who have been called out of the darkness of sin to light of God's forgiving love in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you. Amen. It was a muggy May evening in Greensburg, Kansas, 2007. Suddenly at 9.25 p.m., a siren blast cut through in the eerie calm. They didn't have much time. It would be there in less than 20 minutes. It was a monster F5 tornado, almost two miles wide, wider than the entire town, with wind speeds up to 205 miles per hour. That tornado steamrolled that small Kansas town like a lawnmower driving over a sandcastle. When it was all done, stunned residents reemerged from their homes. They helped each other from the wreckage. Thousands volunteered. Federal disaster relief poured in. But in the midst of it all, there was one unsung hero. The tornado siren. We cringe to think of what would have happened had that siren not gone off and the Greensburgers had just gone about their ordinary lives totally unaware of the impending catastrophe. God's word today reminds you and I that as Christians we have a very important job to do. One that may seem a little mundane on the surface but is truly a matter of life and death. When we see the superstorm of sin threatening to destroy families and homes and lives, do we sound more like a tornado siren or a tin whistle? When we see a brother or a sister falling into sin, do we sound the alarm or do we go silent? God has called us to be his watchmen. Watchmen from whom he expects responsibility, clarity, and courage. Now when it comes to all the careers that are out there, the the job of watchman, I'm sure, isn't probably very high on many of our lists. Because, I mean, what do you really get to do? You try to stay awake all night in a little room watching a, a half dozen little TVs, none of which have football on, Maybe for a change of pace, you get up, you get out your flashlight and your walkie-talkie and you, you stroll around the perimeter looking for anything out in the ordinary. It's cold, it's lonely, it's dark, it's not very exciting. That is, until someone throws a rock through a window or something valuable goes up missing. Then it's your job that's on the line. You're the one that's responsible because you were on duty. Well, it turns out that being a watchman in Ezekiel's day wasn't that much fun either. Except back then they didn't have any TVs or or fancy schmancy infrared cameras. All watchmen had was two eyes, a trumpet, and a whole lot of responsibility. Their job was to stand on top of the city wall and scan the horizon peering out into the darkness for any sign of an approaching enemy. Daydream on that job, and that would cost you your life, the lives of your family, the lives of all your fellow citizens. For that reason, I imagine that a watchman could decline that job. Because who else wants to to put their lives in the hands of someone who's not really feeling up to the task, doesn't really want to do it? But notice that when the Lord called Ezekiel to be his watchman, he gave him absolutely no opportunity to decline. He said, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. But God did not call Ezekiel to stand on top of city wall. His was a much higher spiritual responsibility. He was to serve as the lookout for his fellow Israelites and to give them warning, to repeat God's word of warning on his behalf. When Ezekiel saw unbelief 
and immorality and rebellion, he was to condemn those things in no uncertain terms. Like a doctor holding up an x-ray to a cancer patient, he was to uncover that deep, deadly disease of sin. Now talk about a job that, that no one wants. But if Ezekiel thought for a moment that maybe he could navigate a way through this all just by keeping his mouth shut, he was wrong, dead wrong. The Lord warned him. When I say to the wicked man, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. Notice that once again, God's law does what it always does best. It allows for no wiggle room, no excuses. Ignorance is not going to save the rebellious, wicked sinner from God's judgment, nor would silence release Ezekiel from his responsibility. He was responsible to God for the spiritual welfare of his fellow man. And we may say to ourselves, well, that's all fine and good for the prophet Ezekiel, but hey, that's not for me. My friend, that's kind of the point. It is for you. It's already expected of you. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus said to his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. In other words, as followers of Jesus, we have already been made God's watchmen who are responsible to God and one another for our souls. Jesus puts a trumpet in our hands and his words in our mouth, and he says, go. You're on duty. But who wants to be the person who walks around telling others that they've sinned? We like to make up any and, and every kind of excuse that we possibly can for why we can't, why we shouldn't, why we're incapable of confronting our fellow Christians in what they've done. And to be sure, the closer our relationship is with the offender, the more cowardly we can become. I mean, what do you do when your best friend goes on a tirade and then just starts spouting off four-letter words? Or your teenager comes home from a party smelling of alcohol? Do we make excuses for ourselves and for them? Do we say, well, hey, I'm certainly no angel either? Or do we say, um, I was just as rebellious, maybe even more so when I was their age? Or do we just say nothing at all? And assume that that whole sinful situation is just going to solve itself all on its own? And even if it doesn't, well then, they'll just have to learn things the hard way. In all those natural responses that we might have, we should hear God thundering at us. I will hold you accountable for their blood. You see, regardless of our age, our relationships here in this world, you and I are responsible and accountable to, to God for one another. And as far as God's concerned, every time that we go silent and say nothing at all, we're acting in collusion with Satan, who is hoping that this sin will be the beginning of yet just another soul murder. There is blood on our hands. And my friends, that responsibility, that inescapable responsibility, that kills us. Because it reveals to us the depth of our own lovelessness. 
I mean, how can we claim to love our children, our family, to love each other when we won't even open our mouths to warn one another of the danger that we're in? We turn the other way because we don't want to disturb the peace in our circle of friends. We don't want to ruin this good relationship that we've got going with our teen. We don't want to inconvenience anyone by by putting them on the spot. And all those things, they sound real nice on the outside. That's all a bunch of nonsense. The real person that we don't want to put on the spot or inconvenience is ourselves. So let's shred our list of excuses and realize that by grace, by being called to faith, you and I are God's watchmen accountable to God and accountable to each other. The other thing that God expects from his watchmen is that they speak his word of warning with clarity. Imagine once again if that tornado siren in Greensburg had just pumped out some easy listening tunes instead. No one would have woken up. No one would have gotten the warning. It wouldn't have done any good. So too it is with us. When it comes to sin, God has given us a very clear message. He says, say to the wicked man, O wicked man, you will surely die. Now all the messages that we can communicate to each other, you are going to die, is probably not one that we can or we should Water down. I mean, you don't take your friend aside and say, listen, um, I, I didn't even want to really talk to you about this. Um, it's not really that big of a deal. But you're kind of, sort of, going to die? No, I don't think so. A message of that magnitude needs to be spoken with calmness and clarity and also with compassion. We need to put away our cowardly indifference towards sin because God's word tells us that if you or I or anyone else continues on in their sin, the end product is eternal death. You see, unrepentant sin in our lives is like spiritual carbon monoxide building up in our homes. At first, you don't even realize it. Then you maybe start to get sloppy. You get sleepy. You lay down and take a nap. And then you're dead. Now maybe you think I'm being a little overdramatic, but I'm not. We can all count one too many family or friends whose faith was slowly suffocated to death by that simple phrase, just one more. Just one more sexual encounter. Just one more drink, one more dollar, one more week away from church. That's all it takes. That and no one saying a thing until it's all over. So dear Christians, what are are we to do? When we have first-hand knowledge of one another's sins. Do we cover it up, sweep it under the rug? No, that's way too dangerous. That's like trying to bury toxic waste. Do we come in with guns blazing, all high and mighty and holier than thou? No. We're sinners too. The Lord tells the prophet Ezekiel exactly why he was to warn God's people. It was in the hope of turning them from their unrepentant, wicked ways. Our goal, our motivation of warning one another is not to bash one another, but to turn hearts, to bring one another back to the Savior's open, waiting arms. We are watchmen who warn each other in order to save lives. 
Jesus said the same thing. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won him over. We warn to bring each other back to God. To win back for Christ. And so, when a brother or sister sins, let's gently take them aside, personally take them aside, have a a heart-to-heart conversation with real straight talk and, and tell them, I love you. The Lord loves you too much to let you keep on talking this way or have another drink or to live for your money or your leisure instead of your Lord. God hates those sins in your life. And should they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be brought to to see their guilt, to confess with God's ancient people, Israel, who when they heard Ezekiel's message said, what are we going to do? Our sins are making us waste away. How then can we live? Remember what the Lord said next to Ezekiel. Tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they turn from their ways and live. Our God is a gracious God who takes no delight in vengeance. He wants every single sinner to live. And he is so serious about this that he swears by his very self that he doesn't want a single person, no matter how godless or vile, to continue in their sins and perish in hell forever. Yes, God is serious about our sins, but he is also seriously in love with each one of us. He showed that by sending us His Son, Jesus. On the cross, God took all of our sins. The ones that have just begun in our lives, the ones that are raging out of control, and He put our sin and our guilt on Jesus. Made Him taste the death that we deserve. And He gave us Christ's perfection and holiness. Your sin has not separated you from your God. You can rejoice. There is peace. There is hope. There is mercy and forgiveness and life in your Lord Jesus. Because when he he rose from the grave on Easter morning, pure and spotless in God's sight, God declared you and me and every single person forgiven. That is the clear message that God wants us to proclaim as his watchman. It's the Bible's message of sin and grace, law and gospel, that no sin can be condoned. But in Christ, every sin is atoned. The last thing that God expects of his watchman is courage. It takes courage to do all the things that we've been talking about this morning. Courage to confront a a family member or a friend who has fallen in love with Satan's lies. Especially when we're the ones who have been silent for so long. It takes courage to talk to a, a Christian parent or boss about how they've wronged us. And it takes wisdom to do so with gentleness and respect. It takes courage to confront others about their sins when so often you and I are the ones who need to be taken to task for our unchristian behavior. It takes courage to be God's watchman. Now you may be asking yourself, well, where do I ever get that kind of courage? I'm guessing Ezekiel wondered that very same thing. I say that because throughout his prophecy, the Lord repeatedly refers to him as Son of Man. This is not a term of endearment. Rather, the Lord is tapping Ezekiel on the shoulder and saying, Hey, you, weak, poor, lonely, mortal, Son of Man. 
Come and do the work to which I have appointed you. And therein lies our confidence and our courage. That though we are weak in ourselves, God Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of love, is behind us every step of the way. And with his love in our hearts and his words on our lips, we can be the watchman that he has called us to be. Responsible, clear, and courageous. Amen. Please stand.